it's six o'clock sharp on the dot. So we'll be kicking off our program knowing that we just have one hour. Miss Laurie will be sharing the screen. And if you are joining us, welcome to the African Leadership Group. Yes, on popular vote event. Uh, I will just briefly go over the African Leadership Group, but I wanna give a special shout out to our friend Queen that's joining us all the way from Memphis, Tennessee. She just learned about the organization and was very impressed about the work we do. We want to officially welcome you and uh, tell you that we appreciate you taking time from Tennessee to join us. So again, my name is Papa. I am the founder and executive director of the African Leadership Group. And uh, as an organization, we've been around for 17 years and primarily focus on uh, helping facilitate the professional integration of African immigrants. And we do that through social impact, economic impact, and educational impact. And uh, you will see that uh, one of the, some of the conversation we'll be having today is related to uh, social impact, which is gonna be election. But I also wanna show you very quick all the committees that we have and initiatives that we have. Uh, when we talk about integration, uh, you know, we talk about being integrated professionally, being able to go to school. Uh, so this is all the committee that we put together. If you want to start a business, we have a committee and expert. If you're looking for career advancement, we have a mentorship program, people that will help you. One program that we have that we are very proud of is our education and youth program. Financial home, home ownership, because we know when we talk about freedom, economic freedom will be the way to start fundraising, health and wellness, uh, leadership Africa, public speaking class, and women empowerment. So, but you can always visit us to know more on our website at usalg.org, usalg.org. And one thing I wanna share with you, we really welcome everybody to write on articles. So whatever experience you are having in this country, and if you wanna know the community to know about it, please, please, we welcome you to write an article uh, as we will uh, share it on our newsletter, but also we'll have it on our website. So something to keep in mind. Now, if you just join us, so you will be muted, and, uh, and, uh, so, but you will have the chance to engage with us via chat. So if you have any technical issue, Amadou will be uh, putting his phone number, you can call him, for some reason, if you're not hearing us or you're not seeing the screen, Amadou, that's his role. So he will be just chatting in his phone number so you can call him and uh, he, he will be uh, helping you. So other than that, buckle down and get ready to participate and I'll be about to introduce our speaker. But again, a reminder, don't wait until the end of the presentation to ask your question. Ask your question as we go because we're gonna get them together. We wanna leave enough time for our speaker to answer your question. All right, so welcome Joe Mikloski. And, uh, and you know, it's always easy when you have somebody as a guest, but at the same time, a friend and a mentor. So I've known Joe for many years and he's been a supporter and uh, a big friend of the community. And I was just sharing with the team, when I had the idea to start Leadership Africa, Joe was one of the first one that I sat down to pick his brain and he advised me and guide me. And I'm so proud to tell you, we were fully funded and we were about to launch Leadership Africa this fall. So thank you, Joe. Great. So as you can see on the screen, his biography is like a book, but obviously you know that I won't be reading it, but I'll just, uh, you know, just a few pointers. So in 2015, so Joe created Bridge Consulting and it's a consulting firm that I get to know about. And he does a lot of work around the world. So if you want to engage and knowing more about, you know, how can he help investors in Africa? So that's something that I know he does not only in Africa, but also around the world. Uh, but Joe also served four years as a Colorado representative in District 9. So he has political experience and very involved in the politics in Colorado and has done some work also in Washington. So he created, he focused on renewable energy job increasing healthcare access to thousand and thousand Colorado. But also, like I said, he had a business mindset. So uh, he also involved, he was involved in Project Cure and I got to meet him over there. 
So uh, where he annually donates over $60 million of life-saving medical supply. As you can see, he has a wealth of knowledge, not only in politics, not only in business, but also in community service. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friends, partner, supporters, Joe McCluskey. Joe, welcome. Papa, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you, Lori, and all the staff at ALG. Uh, it's truly um, an honor to be here. Uh, you, you've been a friend for many years. I want to thank you for allowing me to uh, represent a very important ballot initiative called Yes on National Popular Vote that all Colorado voters will have an opportunity to vote yes on this November 2020. Uh, next slide, Lori. One central theme in this presentation, I'll spend about six or seven minutes going through it, and then we'll open it up for question and answer. The central theme is the most votes for the presidency of the United States of America should win, and every vote should count equally, regardless of what state you reside in. Next slide, please. The national popular vote, it's an agreement between the various states to give or award their respective electoral college votes to the presidential candidate who receives the highest national popular vote in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Now this agreement will go into effect when enough states have joined the agreement that total 270 electoral college votes, which is the number needed to win the White House. Next slide, please. The key theme, as I mentioned a second ago, is that the national popular vote will ensure that every vote in every state will be treated equally, not just the votes in around six or seven battleground or swing states. And it's an important distinction to make that the national popular vote improves and enhances the electoral college. It does not eliminate it. Next slide. Now, to date, 15 states in the District of Columbia have joined this compact and they total 196 electoral college votes. So the good news is we're well over two thirds of the way there. We only need about six or seven more states totaling an additional 74 electoral a college votes for the compact or the agreement to go into effect and our goal is to have this in place by the 2024 presidential election. Next slide, please. Now what's interesting, you always have to define the problem. Five times out of 45 presidents or 11% of the time, the presidential candidate who got the highest vote actually finished second. And that's not healthy for our republic or for our representative democracy. Most people know about the two instances that happened within the past um, 20 years, but three times it also happened in the 1800s, beginning in 1824. Next slide. What's interesting to note, the presidency and the vice presidency are the only positions in the United States of America where it's not directly elected. Every governor, state legislator, member of Congress, city councilor, every other position, we have the American citizens voting uh, by popular vote. And again, a key theme is you should not have your vote diluted because you don't live in a battleground or swing state like a Wisconsin or a Florida. Next slide, please. Now, this is a key slide to focus on, and I want to spend a minute. Historically disenfranchised voters disproportionately live in states in non-battleground communities, non-battleground states. For example, 76% of Latino, 82% of Asian American, and 69% of African American voters live in what we call spectator states or one of the approximate 44 states within the United States of America that's not a battleground state. And to give you an example, there are some states that are very democratic like California, and there are some states like Louisiana that are very Republican. So both presidential campaigns, Republican and Democratic, ignore those states because they know they're either gonna win or lose. And they focus all their resources in those six or seven battleground states and ignore the rest of the country. Next slide, please. Now, one key theme, the National Popular Vote Agreement preserves state control of the election, and it's embedded in the only section of the United States Constitution where it mentions the Electoral College. It's Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution that says each state has plenary or complete control to appoint the number of electors as their legislature may direct. And this simply happens by the State House and State Senate and the governor 
passing a bill, which you'll find out Colorado did in 2019. Next slide. Now, for those of you who like to study U.S. Supreme Court history, there's two famous decisions, the 1892 McPherson versus Blacker and the well-known Bush v. Gore U.S. Supreme Court decision in 2000 that confirmed our viewpoint in constitutional law. And they said the appointment and mode of appointment of the electors belong exclusively to the states. And even the very conservative U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who passed on a few years ago, agreed with us. Next slide. Now, in the future, we're going to be targeting some states in the West, in the Midwest, and even in the South. And you'll see, for example, both Republicans and Democrats have supported this. Our goal, again, is to get about six to eight more states in the next couple of years so we're ready for the 2024 presidential election. Next slide. Now, this is a very important point. In 2016 presidential election, over 200 million Americans were ignored because they didn't live in a battleground state like Florida. And as a result, battleground states not only get more presidential attention from both Republican and Democratic campaigns, they get more federal uh, grant money, more disaster relief funds. Every type of fund or political decision is based on the whims of these select small number of battleground states, which is not healthy for a republic or a democracy. Next slide. In 2016, in fact, 94% of all of the campaign events in the last couple months were held in a select number of states, just over 10, and two thirds were in just six states. Again, the rest of the states were ignored. Again, these are both Democratic and Republican campaign events from the 2016 election. Next slide, please. Both conservatives and progressives have said, there's only a few battleground states that decide the election, not the entire country. Again, not healthy for our representative democracy or republic. Next slide. And what that translates into is less voter participation. For example, there are certain states like Utah, if you're a Republican, you're gonna win that state because it's more red. What's fascinating is they sometimes have only 33% turnout for municipal and around 40% turnout for statewide elections. That's not healthy. In battleground states though, they vote with 10% higher frequency because they get more attention. I want the whole country to receive that type of attention from both presidential campaigns. That's healthy for our country. Next slide. Even George Will, a famous Republican or conservative uh, pundit and columnist has said, Colorado now is a flyover state. Typically a state is a presidential battleground state for three presidential elections, the way we were in 2008 or 2008, 2012, and 2016, and uh, both the Trump and Biden campaigns have said, we're no longer a battleground state here in Colorado. Next slide. One of the last slide about this, again, both conservative and liberal commentators have said states like Virginia and Colorado, which used to be battleground, are no longer are. Next slide. Now, the history of national popular vote, it's passed in multiple chambers, small states, medium states, and large states, southern, western, all over the country, and conservative or red states, as well as liberal or blue states. And here are some great examples uh, of that um, diversity politically and geographically. Next slide. In Colorado, we started this movement back in 2006. And finally, in 2019, we uh, had the Colorado General Assembly pass this bill and Governor Pola signed it in March of 2019 into law. So we're currently in the um, agreement, but there's some very um, narrow focus uh, opponents that are trying to withdraw us from this agreement, which is why we're having a ballot initiative in November. Next slide. This is very popular. Um, it's as you can see, over 80% of Democrats, uh, over a third of Republicans, and over 62% of independents support national popular vote. That's nationally, and similar polling data has been conducted here in Colorado. Next slide. National popular vote has bipartisan support. As diverse stakeholders as Bernie Sanders, Newt Gingrich, President Trump, Bob Dole, Tom Tancredo, they've all endorsed in the past at one time or another a national popular vote. This is passed in both Republican and Democratic state house and state Senate chambers throughout the country. And over 3,400 state legislators, Democratic and Republican, have endorsed national popular vote. This last bullet point on this slide is my favorite. 
diverse stakeholders from the NAACP, the trusted League of Women Voters, and even the conservative group called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, their former nine former chairmen and chairwomen have all endorsed national popular vote. Next slide, please. Now, conservatives support national popular vote because of a 10th Amendment states' rights perspective, and liberals or progressives support national popular vote based on equality of voting principles. Next slide. I love this slide because it shows what a purple country we are. Now, these are only presidential elections, but from 1928 to 2016, presidential candidates, Democrat and Republican, they've got the equal number of votes through almost a century. Think about that. There's certain years, obviously, when one candidate wins by a large margin, but when you look at the near 100-year tradition, we're a pretty purple country, which I find fascinating. And again, that would make both campaigns have to campaign to all 50 states, not just six or seven, which is healthy for our democracy and our republic. Next slide. The last few slides I'm gonna go over the two or three common myths that opponents like to say as reasons against national popular vote. They'll say, hey, the two presidential campaigns will only campaign in the largest cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, and New York City are four largest uh, cities in the United States of America. Nothing can be further from the truth. This is fascinating. The 100 largest cities, they vote 63% Democratic and about 37% Republican. They only make up one sixth of the population. Now this next stat, a lot of people don't understand at first, but the rural communities are equal to the 100 largest cities. For example, Colorado Springs is around the 42nd largest city in the United States of America. So some of these cities are very conservative, but rural communities make up one sixth of the population and they vote around 63% Republican and 37% Democratic. So they balance out the 100 largest cities and the remaining voters live in the suburbs, which vote 50-50. Whoever wins the suburbs usually wins the White House. Next slide. So campaigning in the 100 largest cities doesn't get you to 50% plus one vote to win. You've got to expand out to the mid and smaller size communities to win. And people say, well, how do you know that? The next slide proves it. Ohio has been a battleground state for many years. And this is a percentage example of where the campaigns went in 2012, then uh, President Obama and candidate Romney the four largest cities make up about half the population. They spend about half the time in those four cities like Columbus and Cleveland. The next level cities, there's seven cities like Sandusky. They make up about 25% of the population. Both campaigns spend about 25%. And the 53 rural counties make up just over 20%. They actually spent more time because again, if they would just focus on the four largest cities in Ohio, they would not have gotten to 50% plus one to win the state of Ohio and its respective electoral college votes. You have to branch out. Those rural voters and suburban voters are equally important. Next slide. The, the next objection you hear is, well, Joe, don't you know that the founders created the Electoral College to preserve the influence of small states. And that's a misnomer. They confuse that with the Virginia plan that Madison and other founders created, which was two United States senators for each state and then US representatives based on population. That was called the Virginia Compromise because small states like Rhode Island were concerned big states like New York State and Pennsylvania would overwhelm them. The same concerns we have today. And then I say, look at the facts. Of the 13 smallest states, only New Hampshire is a battleground state. And why is that? Because it's 50% Democratic and 50% Republican. The other 12 states that are the smallest states in the United States, six of them are solidly red like Wyoming. We don't go there because it's red. And six states are blue like Vermont, Bernie Sanders state. We don't go to campaign there because they're blue. The outcomes are predetermined. So the size has nothing to do with it. It's how closely divided politically they are. Please don't be confused about the Virginia plan with Medi which Madison and the founders created and what this national popular vote compact is trying to accomplish. And then an interesting statistic, Colorado is right in the middle. We're about the 24th uh, biggest state population wise. Next slide, please.
sometimes people will say there'll be chaos, Joe, if there's another Florida 2000 case. Nothing can be further from the truth. Every four years on the third Monday in December of a presidential election year, the electors will still have to go to their respective state capital, have coffee and tea and cookies, and sign their sheet for the electoral college votes in full transparency and disclosure in front of the media and the public. And all recounts or all disagreements will have to be completed by that date and governed by the respective state law under the Secretary of State and the county laws in that respective county. Those will still exist under the National Popular Vote Agreement. So don't let opponents say there'll be chaos because we're still gonna follow the current law and order systems we have. Next slide. These are the last two slides. I really believe this third bullet's one of the most important, reducing cynicism. I have a friend of mine named Dave, I don't wanna mention his last name, but he's a high school buddy of mine and um, he's never voted. He's a police officer and he's kind of jaded by the political system and thinks, you know, billionaires on both the political left and political right dominate the system. And he's somewhat right, but a US Supreme Court decision once said back in the 70s that that sometimes can be a corrosive influence, like cynicism on our electoral process. National popular vote will reduce cynicism and allow Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated, green, every party to participate more because presidential campaigns will be forced to go to all 50 states, not just a select amount. More people will vote, will maintain election security, and our country will win as a result. So I encourage all of you to vote yes on the National Popular Vote Ballot Initiative this November here in Colorado, and I'm glad to take some questions. Uh, final slide, next. And here's some other things that you can do as well from um, promoting this on uh, your social media contacts, writing a letter to the editor to your paper, even online, and visiting these two websites to learn more than you ever wanted to know about National Popular Vote. And I'm glad to take your questions and thanks, Lori, for helping me with the slides. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, what an amazing uh, presentation here. And yes, we definitely have quite a few questions coming in and I know we'll have more coming. And again, thank you so much for the community that's joined us. And this is what I want to start with. I want to start with asking those of us that can vote, please, I hope we are all registered and getting ready to cast our vote. Now, as you know, the African Leadership Group is a 501c3 organization. We are not here to ask you to vote one way or another, but we're asking you to vote. And literally, and we know this, all those policy, all the things that people are taking decision at Congress, we are among those that are impacted the most. That's why it's very important for us to be involved. And that's why it's very important also to participate in this conversation. So just thank you for making the time. Now, uh, as I'm gonna go through some question, when you have question, just send it through the chat and I'll be reading your question out loud. And uh, I have one uh, question here that came from Sharma. Sharma is asking, could you please elaborate on two or three advantage or reason Republicans give for going against the national popular vote? You mean two or three objections? Yeah, like what are the main reasons, two or three reasons that Republicans goes, are going against well, that Republicans are going against. Yeah. yeah, you know, what's interesting, throughout the United States, this has really been more of a bipartisan issue. I think in Colorado, there has been some efforts by a select number of Republicans to make this a get out the vote activity for Senator Cory Gardner in this year's election. Because in many, many states, for example, Utah or California, you've seen Republicans embrace this because they want their vote counted nationally. And I'll give you a great example. I have a lot of conservative friends here in Colorado who don't like the direction of this state because Democrats control the governor's mansion, the state house, the state senate, and all the statewide elected positions like treasurer and secretary of state. And they're feeling a little bit disillusioned. When they get excited and start thinking about, wow, their vote would count with the national tally, they may knew, know that Trump will lose Colorado in 2020, but they get excited to turn out votes amongst their Republican friends co-workers and family members because their vote would be tallied in a national popular vote, they get excited. And that's good for democracy, it's good for our republic, 
and it makes, makes people less disillusioned to want to participate in our system. Uh, thank you, Joe. And uh, another question that's coming from Alassane Ba. Wouldn't all states have to pass a referendum on national popular vote in order to abolish the Electoral College? No, and here's why. And this is a fascinating uh, longer answer, but I'll make it 30 seconds in brief. Constitutional scholars have always remarked that of the entire short United States Constitution, the only reference to the Electoral College is in Article 2, Section 1. And they devoted a lot of time on this. There's some great books like Constitutional Journal, um, if, which gives you like a newspaper's reporter's perspective on that 120-day Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia. The Constitution is clear. States have complete and plenary control to decide how they allocate their electors. Now, what she is referencing to is Article 5 and a constitutional amendment. If you want to amend the United States Constitution, which we've done well, 27 times, you go through 38 states and two-thirds of the United States Congress. But the brilliance of Article 2, Section 1 of the United States Constitution is that states have complete and plenary control. It's their right and power to decide how they allocate electors. And there's two U U.S. Supreme Court decisions, 1892 McPherson v. Blacker and 2000 decision Bush v. Gore that have confirmed Article 2, Section 1, states have complete authority. That's great. And now we have another question coming from Ann Atwa that's asking, why now? Are all sure. these things happening because of what transpired the last election? So this actually started 1969 when um, Republican senators like then Senator Armstrong of Colorado and Democrats um, actually voted for this in Congress. Many of my colleagues have been working on this since 2006. Now the 2000 and the 2016 election do draw more attention to this issue which is good from a big picture perspective, but this issue has been debated for decades and it's just coming more to fruition because I'll give you a great example. There's a woman that cuts my hair named Chantel. She doesn't follow politics, but she was sharing how her daughter's running for student Congress vice president in her high school here in Colorado. And I said, Chantel, imagine if your daughter won the most votes for student Congress vice president in her junior class, but the principal made the second person finisher <laughs> finish first and win. I said, what would you do? And she said, pitchforks. She understood there's a basic fairness process. That's what, what's happened five times out of 45 presidents where the most votes has won, but they haven't won the White House. It's inherently a fault in the system that could be corrected with the National Popular Vote Agreement. Yeah, we have a question for Miriam. She's saying that you touch on the fact that all states are not battleground states. You said we are working to fix this for 2024. Mm -hmm. My question is why didn't we attempt to do this for this year election? And also how do we change this unspoken rule per se to make our society a democracy like we say it is? So we have been working on this for years, but as you can imagine, this takes time and it's a very deliberative process. So. While we may miss the 2020 election, we always have to keep our eyes on the prize for 2024 and beyond. Your second question, sir, is, is one that touches my heart. It's why I got involved in politics as a young man and served in four years in the Colorado State House of Representatives. We are a republic, which means the power is invested in you, in us, the American people. Now, we're also a representative democracy where we have direct elections for things like city council or mayor or governor. But the basis and beauty of our system, which both liberals, um, moderates and conservatives can embrace is that we are a republic. So while we preserve the electoral college, which preserves states' rights, we can make an elegant solution to, um, to fix electoral college while making sure that no one ever runs again for the president of the United States who doesn't garner the highest national popular vote in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, because that will fulfill, I think, the true intent of our founders to make us represent democracy while still preserving our republic. That's an important balance. Thank you, Joe. If you're joining us, if you just join us, you are live with the African Leadership Group on a town hall discussion with Joe Mikulski on Yes on Popular Vote. And uh, if you just join us, you are muted, but you can definitely chat in your question. And we have a few more questions. So thank you. 
And same thing with our followers on Facebook. So you can really put in your question. Our staff member will take it from Facebook and send it to us so we can ask the question. So Joe, I have a question here from Butterfly that's asking, what can we do to decrease the time it takes to pass a bill, ratify an amendment? It took 23 years alone to pass the equal pay work. She says, thank you to soon to be Senator Janet Buckner and others. So I don't know, maybe she knows something we don't know about. Yeah, uh, Janet's been an old friend. I've endorsed her for state Senate. She's currently a state representative as the, uh, the caller knows well. I mean, here's the thing. Politics is hard, it's arduous, it's long, and you battle some tremendous forces who don't want equality on things like equal pay, which is why I sometimes equate it to the analogy of a football game, moving the football three yards down the field. There's very few times where we have the Hail Mary 50 yard throw like Obamacare or passing social security, but we have to keep advocating day in and day out because we're up against some well-funded, smart and strategic opponents. And that's why we have to expand the pie, get more people like yourself involved because eventually we will win because I believe the historic arc of justice is on our side, but it's very arduous to get there. So actually Joe, this question is for me and I know uh, we have a couple of uh, LG staff that would like to ask the question directly and I'll be calling on them shortly. So Joe, could you tell us for African immigrant and immigrant like us. So the things that are important to us is having a good paid job, being able to afford my health care, having a home, a good education for my children. How a bill like this will help? You, you just defined the American dream. And the beautiful thing about our country over its 240 plus year existence is each generation, each community, each generation of immigrants helps get to define that. Here's the simple answer. Right now, a narrow group of states like Florida get to decide what the presidential issues are. Could you imagine if candidates, Republican and Democrat for presidency, had to come out to Colorado more often to see our beautiful, diverse community? For example, in Aurora, I think we have over 160 languages spoken in Aurora Public Schools, one of the most diverse school districts in the United States, more than Los Angeles or New York City and hear about all the issues that we're facing as a country instead of a, a state like Florida that doesn't have our diversity. The point is our issues that Papa Dia just mentioned will get more attention from both campaigns, more attention from future legislation when we expand the presidential battleground map to have to include the whole country. Our issues will finally get more attention. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to call on Amadou Jang, uh, LG uh, program assistant. Amadou, you said you had a question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Papa. And um, thank you, Joe, for this uh, presentation. So my question is, you earlier you talked about uh, money in politics and how um, your, friend, your friend thinks that billionaires are the one who uh, control um, the political system. Sure, so sure. my question is, knowing that national popular vote will basically force candidates to visit the whole country instead of sure few selected states. That also um, brings us to accept the fact that the process will become a lot more costly. And so won't that, um, won't that uh, impact uh, the fact that money is always going to, be, going to be a problem in the electoral system? So that is to be determined. We've given this a lot of thought and analysis. Right now, each presidential campaign spends around $1.5 billion from their supporters and the money they raise, they raise for a total of around $3 billion. That's a lot of money. And a lot of those are, are called independent expenditures, groups that on the left and the right that will spend money on television advertisements without coordinating with the presidential campaign. We think by actually spreading it out, the money will stay somewhat similar because some media markets like say Nebraska are very inexpensive to advertise on, where some markets like Los Angeles are much more expensive. But instead of taking all those funds in six states, you spread it out because in some states, you may not want to win the state of South Dakota, but you may want to increase your voter turnout for your candidate by two or three percentage points. So you may not spend a lot more money there, but enough to increase voters where they feel like they're being um, paid attention to. Short answer, it's still to be determined, but we think it's going to be a similar amount. Thank you. I just want to remind you, if you have some questions, please feel free to send them via chat. 
Usman Ba, LG staff. So you had a question for Joe. Go ahead, please, Uzi. Yes, and thank you, Joe, for this information again. And one of my yes, questions sir. is, one of the biggest reasons why voters don't even vote is because they feel like their vote doesn't count, you know? Under the Electoral College is a, is a state of consistent that pulls uh, leading to one, one party. And do you think that with this, uh, with this initiative, that could change that? I think it's a step in the right direction, uh, Usman. And you know, you're, you're, the heart of your question, it breaks my heart because I talk to Americans every day who feel like, why should I vote? How does my vote really impact or count? And I try to tell them that, first of all, the old Plato comment, if you don't vote and participate, you'll be governed by your inferiors. But when you do, you actually have a, a chance and a voice to vote. I'll never forget the story of a woman who eventually became a, a member of Congress she um, was a, um, a civic leader in the state of Oregon, and her daughter was playing on a playground set, and she fell and hit her head pretty badly, because back in the day, they had cement at the base of the playgrounds, not that um, tire rubber substance. So she went to her city council and said, hey, why don't we make these playgrounds safer? She was ignored. So she ran for city council that fall. She won. She changed the playgrounds to make them safer for her daughter and all the kids. Uh, outside Portland, Oregon, and then 10 years later, she became a member of Congress, continuing to work on big issues. My point in telling that story is, find your voice, find your value that you think is important. I was having lunch with a woman today who's working on community centers in Aurora to help integrate more individuals from Eastern Europe, the continent of Africa, to feel they can participate in Aurora politics. We all have a gift, we're all God's children, we all have a voice, and we all have a talent. You have talents I don't have find that voice, and then make a difference like that woman from Oregon did. So thank you, Uzi, for that question. So, uh, Joe, I know you, uh, you mentioned that this is the ballot that we're looking to introduce in Colorado. What message do you have for those that are following us from different states, like our friend Queen from Memphis, Tennessee? Please start to donate uh, 25 bucks a month at yesonnationalpopularvote.com because this is really important. It takes a lot of money to spend on television, radio, yard signs, um, um, digital campaigns. It costs millions of dollars. And we're, we've been off to a good start, but we have a long ways to go. And what I've been so impressed about um, this national movement is that whether you're in Vermont or Mississippi, we've gotten donations from, uh, and support from others, as well as thousands upon thousands of Coloradans, because they know this is important. Well, talking about mon money, we have another question here from Miriam that say, it takes a millionaire or some very nice sponsor to run for president. Will this initiative affect the way running for president will work? I mean, I'll, I'll try to give a bipartisan example, but I, I feel like, you know, folks like Bernie Sanders have proved that when you have 3.5 million donors averaging around $24 a donation, that's people power. And there are Republican candidates um, that have come close to that for president. And yes, it can be daunting when you see candidates um, have billionaires on both sides raise money, but I'm continually impressed and will always bet on the American public that when they have a candidate who is selling something in a message of democracy and participation and equality, people will buy that. And um, I think there's been enough examples to show, especially with a uh, um, on bit of digital technology that um, you can fight some of that onslaught of uh, um, dark money. And somebody asking, how would this national popular vote impact the third party candidates? Yeah, right now, both major parties, Republican and Democratic, have had a stronghold on the presidential system. And this um, initiative, I don't think will change that. Um, that's a separate discussion and debate about whether there should be multiple parties. I've always taken the, the viewpoint, I just was golfing with a gentleman from Canada recently where you know, he talked about you've got multiple parties that end up forming coalitions that basically are the conservative um, and the more progressive parties or coalitions that represent basically the United States viewpoints of having conservative and then progressive viewpoints. And right now I'm comfortable with the two party system. So Joe, let me, and, and this question is coming from me. Uh, could you uh, help the community understand your main role in this initiative? And if you have a one minute message to the community uh, right now, what would it be? Sure, um, I've been pleased to work on this as a former state representative, um, a citizen, a current consultant. 
to go and speak to diverse communities throughout Colorado about the importance of their vote. We've talked a lot, and I'm glad we did, on the topic of cynicism or why does my vote count? Sometimes it can be overwhelming and daunting when you think about the numerous amount of um, dark money or interests that try to prevent our voice. I think today's discussions on a variety of topics will show that we need your voice more than ever. And, you know, something my mom once told me when I first got elected, she goes, Joseph, everyone needs to feel needed, regardless of what stage of life we're in, older, younger, immigrant, fourth generation, first generation, we all have a voice to contribute, whether it's through voting yes on this particular initiative or finding your skill to contribute helping homeless, um, which is a huge epidemic in the Denver metropolitan area, helping on um, health care issues, education, water security, food security, food deserts, the issues in life of, of, those, of, of those issues go on. But this is one of those central issues that we need to focus on because it's going to fulfill the intent of our founders to make us a more representative democracy and a more solid republic. You also talk about how important it is for this to be a bipartisan yes. uh, ballot. So could you tell us right now in the support that you're getting from all the Republican candidates, what are the pushback you are getting and who are those people? Yeah, sure. So again, nationally, this has been a very bipartisan issue. In Colorado, this has become a more partisan issue because again, it's becoming a, a get up the vote activity for some Republican candidates. So they've kind of locked down and had been somewhat publicly opposed. Now, privately, you'll talk to a lot of Republicans, both lay people and some electeds. They understand the 10th Amendment conservative rights aspect that, or states' rights aspect to make sure that we preserve our republic and not abolish electoral college. And one point I didn't em emphasize earlier, could you imagine if the United States Congress and federal law dictated all election law in all 50 states. And I'll use the example, whether it's Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi, we sometimes make a joke that if Mitch McConnell would set Colorado law in uh, election law for us in all the countries, he'd make you own three guns before you were allowed to vote. And then um, some of my friends on the left um, joke if Nancy Pelosi decided what the um, election law was for, throughout all 50 um, states, um, you wouldn't have to be a citizen to vote. Now I'm making some funny, um, exaggerations, but my point is states should be able to decide what the election law is. And that's a, a principle I think both conservatives and liberals can embrace because that's a state's rights issue. Great. I mean, we, and this is, Joe, I, I think one hour was not enough. We made a mistake here. <laughs> so, um, so another question from Alassane Bad that's asking, so if half of the state pass a referendum on popular vote and the other half keep the electoral vote, how will the presidential winner be determined? So under the current system, as well as if the National Popular Vote Compact would pass, that wouldn't really happen. So let, let me review. Right now, we have about three and a half million voters, about five and a half million inhabitants in the state of Colorado, but about three and a half million voters. And whoever wins 50% plus one in a presidential election year, all of those um, electoral college votes, of which there's nine from the state of Colorado, go to the presidential candidate that won the state of Colorado. What's interesting is every vote after 50% plus one is almost a wasted vote because you've reached your tally. It doesn't go to a national tally. So under the current system, we would give our nine electoral college votes to the presidential candidate who won the highest national popular vote in all 50 states with the other compacting or states that are in our agreement with us. For example, we have agreements with other states on water rights um, sharing and trade relations. This is the same kind of agreement we have with 15 other states in the District of Columbia. And that's what makes it so powerful because we're electing the presidency of the United States and the most votes should win and every vote should count equally. So another question from Eve that's asking, what would you say to people who don't believe that change uh, will happen because of the uh, special interest group is too powerful and influential? So you have a group of people that are very powerful and influence. So, and the average citizen would be like, you know, it won't change won't happen. What would you say to those people? I'd say, watch us what we've delivered and watch our actions. And I'm referring to you, uh, me, and all the people that support national popular vote here in Colorado and throughout the United States of America. We have gotten two thirds of the states necessary to join this compact 
who've already joined. All we need is about six or seven more states. We're already there. We've done this in less than 20 years. And in any political issue I've worked on, that is tremendously fast. Sometimes people want things to happen overnight, but we've made great progress. And we have a number of states that are debating this as we speak and will over the next couple of years. So thank you. If you are following us, we are live on Facebook also. Thank you so much for your question. And Joe, we still have some questions that are coming through the chat, but also I want to let our Facebook followers, they can send their question via Facebook chat and the team will make sure that we get to this question. And if yes. for some reason we did not get a chance to answer your question today, we'll uh, uh, send it to Joe and he will get back to you via email. So now another question here is, would national popular vote eliminate the threat of faceless electors? It's almost a moot point, and here's why. Regardless of how the United States Supreme Court rules on a late April 2020 or argument debate on this faithless elector issue, what's going to happen in the future, 2020, 2024, and beyond, is that both Republican and Democratic parties will nominate electors in their respective state who are either so Republican or so Democratic that the faithless elector issue will be moot. Some background and context. Right now, about 29 states have a rule that says you have to vote as an elector the way the majority population voted in that state's respective presidential election. 21 states do not have a law about that issue, which is why the United States Supreme Court took up this issue in April. And by the way, if you go to the U.S. Supreme Court website, you can listen to the oral arguments. I believe it's from April 28th about this issue. It's a fascinating uh, conversation. It makes you wish you would have been um, a constitutional lawyer. And this month, in June of 2020, the US, US Supreme Court's anticipated to make a decision. But the good news is, is that national popular vote is not going to be impacted by that because electors are going to become, I think, even more um, partisan in how they vote for their respective nominee. So do then, uh, what would you tell us, what should we expect uh, uh, when, it, when it comes to this issue? Should we expect to see that in the upcoming ballot and what ballot is going to be? And yeah. what the question and, and how can we be involved in this? So in Colorado, as you know, we um, are a vote by mail state. About 80% of Colorado voters vote by mail. Um, when I was a state representative, for example, uh, I helped us become the third state in the country to register to vote online, not to vote online, but to register to vote. And over 1.5 million voters, a third Democratic, a third Republican, and a third unaffiliated have used that website over the last 10 years to register to vote online. So we're a very uh, participatory, civic engagement um, state. You'll get your ballots around October 15th. You'll have to vote um, uh, by you know, the first uh, Tuesday in November uh, for that election. And um, you can always call me with questions, but I encourage you to post on social media, write a letter to the editor, even donate, um, and go to yesonnationalpopularvote.com to learn more. But we, we need your vote, and um, it's a very simple um, uh, ballot language which I'll read to you. Uh, you'll get your ballot in the mail, and it'll say as follows. Shall the following act of the Colorado General Assembly be approved? An act concerning adoption of an agreement among the states to elect the president of the United States by national popular vote. It's very simple. And again, the most votes should win and every vote should count equally. So Joe, and, and we are just uh, getting to the last 10 minutes of the program. Thank you for joining us. And we have room for two more questions. Now, Joe, if community members uh, are interested in getting involved and they have political aspiration, uh, how can they involve in this issue and how can they work with you? Because in our community, when you train the trainer and they come back, it's a lot easier for the message to go through. What are the opportunities for community members to get involved in this? Yeah, a couple of things. Please have them call me. Uh, Lori, give out my cell phone and email and we'll get you plugged into some of our great uh, community volunteer outreach coordinators to help plan um, house parties, events, social media events that you could maybe host uh, with your communities. Um, secondly, if anyone has an interest in running for office in the future, I've helped recruit, train, and elect over 50 people, mainly women and people of color, to run for the city council and other positions. I'd be glad as a service to Papadia to host a future seminar on a separate note and help you do that because, again, we need more diverse voices 
um, in elected bodies and the, the, the table of power needs your diverse voice. I'm glad to do that free of charge. Now, uh, and Joe, you are a member of the Democratic Party, correct? Yes, I am. Yes, so, uh, and uh, as, as community, quite often we feel like people are coming to us only when they need our vote. What can you share with the community, uh, especially this time around, and especially what's ahead of us, as sure. we come to working with people like you and also working with leaders with the Democratic Party in the state of Colorado? Sure. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing I want to mention is, you know, I spent eight years at a wonderful organization called Project Cure, which is right here in um, Centennial, Colorado. I was the director of government relations and I'd help them raise government grant funds and other sources of revenue. And I've been to now 11 countries on the continent of Africa. I've worked in about 30 of the 55 countries on the continent of Africa um, by phone on healthcare system strengthening projects to donate medical supplies in hospitals as well as work on food security and agriculture projects to help smallholder farmers, especially female farmers, grow crops in a more sustainable and profitable way in Mozambique, in Zambia, Ghana, Nigeria. Um, I go every year to about six countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I mention that because I've always had a heart for people who sometimes feel marginalized in a community. And when I go to Aurora Public School, I go to a Denver Public School, I, I speak to, um, volunteers at Project Cure or, or go anywhere to a faith community, a church, a mosque, um, a synagogue, that people want to feel like they're part of something. And that's something I've devoted a lot of my life to. I almost became a minister as a young man, but chose the path of politics and nonprofit work instead, because I really believe you can make an impact in the public square, just like you can in the pulpit. And this is one way I try to do that. Well, thank you, Joe. Now, uh, if you could please just if uh, let the community know if they want to read more, learn more, where would they go if there's a website and what's the resources that's out there for them to know more about this issue? Sure. Yeah, the best website is yes on nationalpopularvote.com. Yes on nationalpopularvote.com. It's it goes through 120 myths about national popular vote. It allows you to donate to national popular vote. It talks about ways to get involved, and then uh, Lori will share my information uh, with all of you. I'd love to chat with you one-on-one -on -one to see if we could organize some grassroots outreach, um, house party, Zoom meetings uh, within your particular personal, professional, and civic um, uh, organizations. Thank you, Joe. And uh, community members, thank you for joining us. And we'll have Joe here just come up with his closing remark. But what I would like to add to everything that we have heard and some of the question it's time for us to be in, to get involved. And when I say to get involved, I'm talking about to be politically involved. If you have an aspiration to serve, if you want to be a school board of director, if you want to run for city council, please don't think it's impossible. We have the resources, we have the people that will be on your side to help you. As I always say, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> If you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And the only way to be at the table and the, at the head of the table is to be politically involved. So those days that people are making decisions for us should be long overdue and gone. It's time for us to be involved in the solution to our own issue. It's time for us to decide on what we want. Now, getting involved is uh, MDCS popular vote. Is it the first step? It could be. I will let you to decide on that. What is sad is for us to be able to vote and decide and choose not to. Mm -hmm. So get involved, have your voice heard. We are facing this pandemic and we know there's much more to come, but if we wanna change anything, let's be politically involved. So Joe, I wanna turn it to you uh, for your closing remark and I'll come back with some announcement that I have when it comes to upcoming event for the African Leadership Group. Joe, what are your closing remarks? Papa, Lori, the whole African Leadership Group team, thank you so much for having me here. I felt like I was amongst friends. Uh, I love how so many um, individuals participate in ALG um, Zoom webinars. My message is simple. The most votes for the presidency of the United States should win the White House. Five times in our country's history, or 11% of the time, that hasn't happened. Our founders got many, many things right. The beautiful thing they did when they created the United States Constitution was to ensure that we could work through states and state legislatures to make sure 
that we have a system where the most votes wins and every vote is counted equally. And right now that's not our current system. We have a small number of states of which Colorado is not one that is deciding the presidential message, receiving all the campaign dollars and receiving future federal government grant funds because they have more power that's unequal. I want us to have equality, one person, one vote, and that the most votes should win. I thank you again, Papa. I look forward to continuing the conversation one-on-one -on -one, um, with your cohorts. Well, thank you, Joe. It was truly a pleasure to have you. And uh, as I mentioned, you've been a friend of the African Leadership Group and the entire community. This is your house. Anytime you have the need to have a conversation with us, please just know you are most welcome. So, thank uh, you, yeah, thank you. I want to just have this announcement. You know, like most businesses, when the pandemic hit, a lot of people kind of slowed down. But for us, it's been extremely busy day in and day out because we are primarily focused on giving the resources and the information to the customer, to the community. I, I, I just can't thank enough the team that I have. Literally, we don't even have time to sit down and, and, and enjoy our meal, but we love what we do is to provide the resource to the community. Team, I cannot thank you guys enough, Lori, Eve, Maryam, Usman, Amadou, and all the volunteers that we have, and all the people that take the time out of the busy schedule, Alassane and Atwa, Tasha, I mean, everybody, but we are stronger together, and you guys always demonstrate that. So on Saturday, June 27, we have a business economic summit, and this is the second round. The first round was when we were discussing on how do we help businesses to have access to the PP loan. Some get it, some still don't get it, but we are doing a second round now for people to understand how do I use this money in order to get it as a grant? Because there's a lot of questions that's tied to it. If you use it one way versus another, you will have to pay back this loan. And a lot of other things, the tax implication. So on June 27, uh, we are having it from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Our partners from the World Trade Center, from the International Immigrant Affair, we have a tax accountant, uh, loan officer. So please, please uh, share it with your friend. It's on our social media. So uh, I look forward to have you. Now, we are, as I said, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. Now, as an organization, we believe in those so much that we just don't wait for people to find those leaders for us. We build those leaders that we want to have a seat at the table. We are so happy that we are getting ready to launch our first cohort of Leadership Africa. And it's a 12 months curriculum program and the future city council we want, the mayor, board of director, whoever, we are looking to provide them the resources and the training. Look forward to it. I hope all of you will apply and uh, get a chance to participate because we need you as leader in the community. Now we are getting ready to do our biggest event, Africa Impact, which is in August. Now, obviously with this COVID-19, there's some program we're gonna change to uh, virtual, but please save this date. August 15, uh, we're having the cultural event, August 18, education forum, August 20th, the business forum, and the 22nd is the annual gala, and we put TBD because we don't know. But just save this date, but look forward to see you guys on the 27th on the Business Economic Summit. Again, it will be a great, great. So we are right exactly at the hour. I'm so proud of myself to be able now to keep, keep this program within the time we schedule. So, and we no longer African time. Those days are gone. <laughs> no more African time. But we wanted to thank you all for joining us. And uh, let's give a round of applause to our speaker, Joe. And thank you. Well thank done. you. Yes, so thank you. Thank people. you. Pleasure. And, and please check us on, uh, on our website, usalg.org. If you're looking for information, uh, what we have coming up, we're always updating the website on a daily basis. And honestly, I want to give a special shout out to my sister queen that's following us all the way from Memphis, Tennessee. Can't wait to have you in Colorado. So thank you for joining us. Emmanuel, thank you. Everybody enjoy your evening. Happy Father's Day. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day to all the fathers. <laughs>